At any rate, I cannot support a proposal that gives all of the agency jobs to the Japanese. I don't give a fuck. In order to gain the benefits of those special uh, offers, Windows, our countrymen prepared a large sum of money, as though squeezing their own blood out to do it. To us, we're simply collecting on our investment. The interpretation of the special offers window is too broad. To Primavera, that argument went like this. The special offers windows belong to them. Yeah. Therefore, they are free to distribute the jobs gained through it. To let whomever work for whatever wages Primavera pleased. How about this, buddy? You can just give me, uh, a hundred million, uh, dollars or whatever, and, uh, you can have it. And you can decide how you want to split it up. However, Chinatown had a different view. I don't give a fuck. The special offers window was nothing more than the right to steal jobs, uh, steal project funds by passing on jobs. It did not contain, in the, contain the right to exclude their Chinese brethren from the end laborers. Yeah, it does. Because I choose whose uh, money I steal from. Of course, Lee understood why Lee Rose had wanted the special offers window. But even so, he couldn't abandon his duty as a representative of his countrymen's interests. I don't give a fuck. Let me say this as a representative of a small rock Chinatown. Let's hear it. We would like to abandon this. Uh, well, I'd like you to abandon this plan for a city 23 Japanese labor union. If you were to carry out this plan. We would have to take proper defensive measures to protect the lifestyle of our countrymen. And by de defensive measures, you mean? Any actions without restrictions taken with the goal of protecting our countrymen. So you'd go as far as war. It means we reserve all options that might be necessary to protect our countrymen. Push it. Which of those we choose is for you to decide. In other words, no matter what the result is, the responsibility lies at your door. No? That's not how this fucking works. If you go to war with us because we're paying people more money, that's literally on you. When you could just pay them more money. Lee honed his words and slammed them against the other two. Just because someone says, like, it's always on you, doesn't mean it's actually just on you. It was an unshakable responsibility to protect one's countrymen. A splendid threat to uphold that responsibility admirably. Fuck him. Considering the GDS's position, this was extremely natural. It was hardly an unpredictable reaction. Of course, Richard and Rose weren't so naive that they assumed he would agree to this proposal easily. Please forgive me. Once again, we're both doing our jobs. How about this? We won't form a union if you pay an X percentage, and then you can have a say into this. Otherwise, you aren't you don't have the fucking skin in the game like we do. Then we may exchange cold words. We are still friends. I wouldn't want you to misunderstand. Of course, given your position, it's only natural for you to say that. So we have another proposal, to make it in hopes of gaining your approval. Let us hear it. We propose the uh, concurrent establishment of a City 23 Chinese labor union. What do you mean? Both Chinese and Japanese, er, Chinese and Japanese people go to the employment agency. We're fully aware that it would be unfair to let it, just one group have all the jobs. If a human union to distribute jobs to the Japanese is to be established, the same thing ought to be established for the Chinese as well. An inter interesting proposal, but as you know, we possess no special offers windows. We have no negotiation pipe to the American uh, 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 occupying forces, much less to their higher levels. We wouldn't be able to obtain those special off offers windows for any amount of money. The occupying forces in the American army-run districts didn't take a favorable view of the expansion of Chinatown's influence. I mean, all you have to do is, uh, do, like, contract bidding. And say, like, oh, these jobs we, like, secured from, like, uh, Chinese, Japanese, the unions. Put up money and su secure those. It'd probably be difficult to set up a direct pipe between ch the Chinese and the Americans. That's why when Caleb showed interest in dealing for the special offers windows, 
Lee had wanted to support him and take a piece of the action. However, Caleb re had rejected Lee's offer to supply funding. Later on, the group they allied with themselves with Primavera acquired enough financial clout to make assistance from Chinatown unnecessary. They started buying City 23 special offers windows without Lee's support. Nice. First, I want to make it clear that we intend to use the special offers and windows that we hold to repay our countrymen. Acknowledging that is no different than allowing for the exclusion of the Chinese laborers. As long as we have no special offers windows on our own, that is. That's right, if Chinatown had their own special offers windows, we would have no objection to them using those to support the Chinese laborers. I.e., you have to pay for them, bitch. We are prepared to sell your group some of the City 23 special offers windows we possess. Huh. For once, Lee was stunned silent. True enough, even while the special offers windows can be bought directly from the Americans, they might be able to obtain through the Japanese. However, that would probably result in Primavera earning the displeasure of the occupying forces. That's what we call a premium markup. Well, I find it hard to imagine that Captain Butler would go along with that. To the Captain, nothing is more important than having peace in this city as underworld. We have already obtained his consent in this goal, if it will serve to further this goal, this matter, if it will serve to further this goal. How much are you willing to let us have? 20% to start? We're thinking up to a maximum of 30%, depending on the negotiations. The long sought after special offer is Windows of City 23. Gaining those would grace Small Rock Chinatown with considerable stability. Chinatown seemed to be dazzling on the outside, but unless it had a special offers window, that lack of a foundation would always be a source of uneasiness. As far as anyone knew, the political opposition between America and Chinatown might grow in the future, and harsher exclusionary measures might be taken up by both sides. If that happened, the presence or lack of a special offers window could greatly affect the fate of City 23's Chinatown. Of course, Prima Vera could cha charge them a considerable sum. However, they had money. This was a chance to buy something that normally wouldn't be bought with money. That was Primavera's bargaining point in this plan to establish a union. Also, we can take that money and reinvest it in like a bunch of other shit in our area. For Leo, it was a chance to succeed in a glorious achievement. Hmm. If I accept this proposal and we quickly establish labor unions for the Chinese and Japanese, what will happen? Higher wages? On the face of it, the trouble involving the members of the both nations fighting for jobs would go away. However, that was assuming wages were the same for both unions. Unless they had the same high wages as the Japanese side, resentment among Chinese laborers would probably explode. Raising the wages for laborers would make it impossible to use the greatest advantage of holding special offers windows, the ability to snatch up some of their budgets. Fucking greedy son of a bitch. To the high-ranking elders of the GDS, that advantage was an extremely delicious side job. However, if they wanted to raise wages to match the Japanese side, they would have to abandon that side job. There's no way these greedy elders would agree to it. Of course, the elders were displeased with Primavera's plan to raise wages. Laborers had left City 22 in droves, and the shortage of workers was becoming noticeable. Demands from the workplace for higher wages were growing fierce and it was liable to cause trouble for their side job in City 22. The GDS higher-ups had or ordered him to somehow put a stop to Primavera's wage-raising plans, but... Damn those senile old fools. Lee silently co complained inside his head. Do you realize how many of our Chinese brethren have suffered because of your greed? Rose, the Japanese person, was born as a dragon, determined to save her countrymen. We need a Chinese dragon to be born as well, to save ours. The only one who can spell out that ideal and make it a reality is our young lord. The special offers window ought to be brought whatever mon uh, to be bought whatever the monetary cost. We ought to deal with Primavera. We can let our brethren within City 23 receive the benefits of higher wages too. The problem is our brethren in City 22. What better than to use this chance to raise wages in City 22 as well? 
Haven't you cheated your way to enough money already? Isn't it time to return the benefits of the special offers windows back to our countrymen? At any rate, only the Greed Council, Greedy Council of Elders would be a bottleneck. However, I'm sure the young lord will be able to keep the council quiet. It's about time the elders learned. Learned that they can't take money with them to the other side. Hmm. Your proposal is quite a tempting one. However, it will be a difficult decision. I would like to have to be given some time. My apologies, but we'd like to have the first premise of this deal to be swift approval of the labor unions for our countrymen. Our countrymen want stable wages and a stable way to get them, as quickly as possible. Because of that, we want to resolve this issue as fast as we can. Our proposal to share the special offers windows we suffered so much to buy is dependent on repeat, receiving immediate approval for the establishment of unions. <laughs> You've gotten much better at negotiation, Rose. If you tried to force the establishment of unions, I would lose face. But instead, you also dangle an alluring treat before me. Quite splendidly done. Thank you. Lee, we're also frantically trying to save our countrymen. Even so, we realize there are people living in the city besides our countrymen. Eh, fuck them. So instead of advancing matters on our own, we've come to you with a proposal like this. I understand, of course. While you could have ignored us and established a union on your own, you gave me room to negotiate. I must express my gratitude for you to allow me to save face. True enough, this doubled as a message that Primavera had no desire to ignore the GDS. Furthermore, Li was pro-Japanese. At this time, most Chinese people felt that, since the Japanese were members of a defeated nation, there was no point in talking with them, or even a footing. On even footing. That made Li a very convenient person for Primavera to deal with. They didn't want to embarrass him, so they had thrown in a deal for the special offers window as a remarkable precondition for their plan. Likewise, Lee didn't want to embarrass them. They were a new power of uncertain strength. If a feud were ever to break out between them and the GDS, Lee would bear all the responsibility. He had to preserve a loose relationship while still letting Rose save face. So, we will each build unions and give jobs from our respective special offers windows to our respective countrymen. Together, we'll be able to hand out excellent wages to everyone. With your assistance, we can make the ideal come true in City 23. On a personal level, I greatly sympathize with your ideals. However, without time, there will be no way to arrange matters on my end. Can't you give me some time so I can make adjustments that will lead to a satisfying conclusion for us both? Of course, it would be intolerable for you if I used this as an excuse to waste time. That's right, this is now or never emergency in City 23. And so I'd like to have this be a gentleman's agreement based on the personal trust you and I share. To produce the best possible result, I would like you to trust me and allow me a bare minimum of time. How much time are we speaking of? I cannot give you a concrete answer, but I'm fully aware that you have no time either. Can't you compromise on this point on the basis of the trust between fellow members of City 23? Understood. Rose, it would be better to set a time limit. Let's put our trust in Lee. I believe our trust and coexistence are what will bring peace to this city. You got a month, dude. You have my thanks, Madam Rose. I promise that we will not break your trust. Thank you, Lee. I believe you could have applied more pressure than that. They're people who we have to coexist with. There's no need to pick a fight. Do you realize how much Chinatown has expanded this past year? To protect the livelihoods of our countrymen, we ought not to let them expand any further. What's the worst case scenario you're imagining, Richard? We get fucking bodied by Chinese moving in. All of Tokyo being taken over by Chinatowns. Their solidarity is formidable. The Chi Japanese, whose solidari solidarity, solidarity isn't nearly as strong, will be forced out of Tokyo. So are you saying that our res resilience is no match for theirs? We are a people being driven out. Tenacity and cunning. In all ways that matter, the Japanese have no advantages over the Chinese. 
Do you know why the sea of Japan is called by that name? It's because without that sea, this place would have been part of China from the start. The country known as Japan would never have been born. We're an immature people cut off from the we weeding out of, uh, on the mainland by the Sea of Japan, and unbaptized by progress. In a struggle for existence, we cannot defeat them. We'll be weeded out from Japan. Surely you have seen the warning signs. Truth be told, in Tokyo of 1948, half of the city, 22 independent cities, excluding City 1, were under Chinese military control. Ne nearly all of them have become Chinatowns. So half of Tokyo has already become Chinatown. Also, City 23 wasn't the only American-controlled city that had Chinatown advancing in on it. There are many people besides Richard who felt that all of Tokyo was becoming a Chinatown. Look, the Americans have the ability to, like, force them out, though. In the end, we cannot coexist with them. Have you always been a person who thought like that, Richard? Wasn't it your motto that beliefs and nationality were meaningless to, in business? Yeah, but it's meaningless if the other side also believes that. Nationality and beliefs don't matter in business so long as each side has that idea. If each side doesn't believe in that, it's fucked. You're screwed. That's nothing but empty talk of money worshippers. I may not- I may have been like that when I was a mere l money lender, but not anymore. Yuji won't be able to ignore this danger if he is to protect Japan for the children of the future. In the past, when he was a businessman and a moneylender, he hadn't cared at all about the nationality of those he dealt with. However, since becoming the consigliere of an organization for mutual cooperation between countrymen, his way of thinking was apparently beginning to change. I don't want you to misunderstand. I agree with your position with the Chinese are neighbor, uh, that the Chinese are the neighbors whom we ought to coexist with. I understand that your position is one that keeps our mind, future in mind. However, if it's at all possible, I would choose to coexist with them. If the Japanese are an immature people, then there ought to be a lot of for us to learn living as alongside people as resilient as they are. I think we should place more trust in our children of the future. An optimistic view. Would you throw a rabbit into a lion's cage and expect it to learn resilience? I want to believe that our children of the future will live resiliently and adapt to a new era. They'll learn several languages, such as English and Chinese, accept the differences in culture and the common sense by other countries, and gain the ability to adapt. They'll gain the vitality to boldly set out across the many vast countries of Asia, not just this small Japanese island chain. And all the while, they won't lose their identity as Japanese people. They'll protect the culture they've inherited. If that is impossible, then we may be destroyed as a people. However, if that's the case, then I want them to hold on to one thing, the willingness to care for other people. I want that. I want only that, to be our people's pride, regardless of how immature we may be. Well, it certainly is true that a peace based on friendship is the cheapest to maintain. I'm sure Lee will understand. I'm sure we'll be able to build a utopia in City 23. Yeah, okay. Lee couldn't give a fuck. Rose sighed and closed her eyes. For the sake of her ideals, she had to raise her spirits and make a de decision she would rather avoid facing. Rose slept for a while and, Ro and Richard gazed at the city through the car window with a distant look. And I will search for a new card that will help us in our negotiations. For the future of our children as well. I won't let anyone get in the way of the future you envision. Not even Lee. Nice. Chapter 1, Utopia of 1948 is ended. Good shit. Oh, back to these guys. Or not. At night it was a pub, but during the day it was a restaurant that seemed to be aimed at younger people serving pizza and pasta. Apparently they were having a meeting. Char okay, yeah. Charles ordered pizza and drinks as though it was something he did all the time. With enough for four people set up at a on a round table, it looked like a little party. Today we were having dinner a bit early. 
Wild dogs are becoming have dreams of becoming wolves. We're members of Will's crew, the wild dogs. Wild dogs? That's w uh, Wayne's team. A band of ba brats who knew everything about this city. Who know everything. The wild dogs are basically a crew. Oh, that means a sub-organization of the Primavera family. The Primavera family was a large organization that consisted of several sub-organizations. Those sub-organizations were called crews. The bosses of the crews were called chapos. And they moved according to the instructions given by the grand boss, Cyrus, the boss of bosses. Hey. And the assistance of the grand boss, uh, with the assistance of the grand boss and the consigliere, Madame Rose reigned at the peak of the organization. Fucking three headed dragon. The crews were called sub-organizations. They were made up of influential powers who had controlled sections of city, the city before the Caleb era. For example, the rich Bombo, controlled by James Tomitake, ran several gambling spots and wielded considerable monetary power. James had become consigliere Richard's right-hand man and supported Primavera's financial affairs. Then there was a, also a battalion, controlled by Maurice Monobe, which controlled the elites from the front lines that had been feared in Caleb's day. They now formed the core of Primavera's fighting force. Maurice was the head bodyguard in charge of protecting the grand boss Cyrus, and was always keeping a close lookout. There were also several other forces that could easily have formed a family in the past, all of whom had become crews supporting Primavera. At the very end of the list of the powerful crews lay the wild dogs controlled by Wayne. Um... So that's how Primavera is structured. All us wild dogs were raised in back alleys. To us alley rats, there's no way we'd rather there. There's no one we'd rather be like like than Wayne. Everyone wants to be famous and get wealthy and a reputation, just like Wayne. Well, we're also the most puny crew working under Primavera. We may be lacking when it comes to wealth and guns. However, there are weapons that only those of us who grew, grew up in the alleys possess. Because we know all the alleys of the city back and front, our noses can sometimes pick out things no one else can. You might call us an intelli intelligence corps, familiar with the city's secrets. Oh wow, that's cool. <laughs> it means those adults gotta tip their hats to their animal instincts. Well, we're basically just a group of brats, the small fry of Primavera, small fry. However, even Wayne was a greenhorn once. From there, he built up a legend, and eventually managed to become Ro Madame Rose's exclusive god. He may be the youngest ca chapo, but he's one of the seven legendary people who can chat casually with the grand boss. That's how far he climbed. I'm sure we'll make a name for ourselves as wild dogs. And then we'll be le legends like Wayne. We're the proud dogs of the wild wolves. We're the proud wolves of the wild dogs. Even a wild dog can become a wolf if it sharpens its fangs. No one can beat us when it comes to having big hearts and drive to become great. Incredible, you all look so inspirational right now. I'm sure you'll achieve something fantastic, I guarantee it. I'm sure you'll accomplish something that the other wild dogs can never do. Indeed, we will surely create legends. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing if you praise us so much. Uh, well, one step at a time, right? <laughs> The three of them grimmed embarrassingly. As they did, the store was growing more and more lively. Everyone there was young and seemed to know these three. They were probably all members of the Wild Dogs. The store must have been their gathering spot. However, we were the only ones dressed roughly, and the others were all in suits. You three always show up early, don't you? Well, at least you have that going for you. Hey there, Charles, uh, Charles, Lee? Charles, Charles, Lee? so you're looking as short as ever. Shut up. What's height got to do with it? Better stop. Get this guy mad and you'll, you'll find your wallet suddenly missing. You still on the top of your game with that. Didn't Wayne forbid you from doing it? Better keep it under control. 
Now you've done it. Talk smack about me. And you'd better keep a close eye on your wallet for the rest of your life. Charles tossed a wallet onto the counter. Apparently it belonged to the man who had joked about his height. They looked shocked, as though someone had just shown them a magic trick, and they burst out laughing, acknowledging the hit. Huh? What just happened? Is that a magic trick? Back in our alley days, Charles was a master pickpocket. He always earned the most out of all of us. He was also a bit of a hero back then, but now Wayne's forbidden him from pickpocketing. No helping it. I'm getting enough money to eat from Wayne. Rule says people with enough money to eat can't pickpocket. Take pickpocketing away and Charles is just a brat. Hey there, Oliver. Long time no see. Nina, I hear they made you quit the club again. Shut up. That's none of your business. Nina isn't suited to be a lady of the evening. She always gets in fight with the customers. If you think any woman can make men happy just like that, you're sadly mistaken. I'm just not suited for that. That's all. Still, she's awesome with the uh, pachinko. Pachinko? It's a slingshot. The thing made out of a Y-shaped stick with elastic in it, on it that shoots balls. Eh, that takes me back. Nita really was a pachinko genius. She could hit anything she wanted, no matter how far away it is. It's really amazing. So stupid. Bragging about something like that won't earn you any food. It would have been so much better if I could pickpocket like Charles. This isn't any good to me now. I want to reach Oliver's height and make a legend fighting. Huh. <laughs> Little Charles here to have major issues being a bodyguard, wouldn't he? Shut up, be quiet. We're busy polishing our skills. I see you're still you're as much of a bookworm as ever. You realize studying isn't what you need, don't you? Wade's always disgusted with the way you jump the gun. I want to become a wolf as fast as possible. It's only people at Wayne's level that get to them that get to call themselves lone wolves. We're just dogs, wild dogs. Just what are you thinking, moving without your pack? It's the same for Oliver. He's got a few issues. You know he's uncooperative, impatient to achieve great things, and stubborn. He may not look like it, but he used to stand at the head of the pack. However, Oliver's desire to improve it was too strong. Impatient to achieve greatness, he started trying to leave his friends in the dust and make a splash in the world before any of them. His comrades criticized him harshly, saying he was uncooperative, didn't listen, and was trying to hog every accomplishment for himself. In the end, Wayne had scolded him harshly for it, and he'd grown deeply depressed. He's always been sort of a selfish egomaniac. He'd had no friends ever since the alley days. Well, he did get what he asked for. You're all friends, aren't you? We're just a bunch of failures sticking together. All their fellow wild dogs who came into the store one by one were wearing nice suits. From what I could overhear from their conversations, they're all bodyguards or drivers or doing some sort of job. Come to think of it, I've never seen Oliver, Charles, or Nina doing a job until today. Oops. So do y'all have jobs? Yeah. <laughs> We're wild dogs. We can't fucking work. Lone wolves are always ready for jobs that come their way. Well, we're pretty clumsy. We keep messing up any job we're given. I want to know why she argues with customers uh, and why she can't be a lady. I want to know that.